Right, hello everyone again for another one of our legal lowdowns on the lockdown, although strictly speaking we may not actually be in lockdown anymore, broadcasting on or recording on the last, on the evening of the first day of level two. What we're going to do today is talk a lot about some New Zealand developments. We're going to talk about um, the court action which is going on challenging the validity of the stage three lockdown. But also we're going to talk about perhaps the most important development of this week, which has been the statute, which has gone through Parliament um, yesterday and the rules that came into effect at 12 o'clock this morning. But first of all, what we're going to do is to talk about other places, because obviously the reason it's a pandemic is that COVID is everywhere and other countries have different legal responses and we're going to invite for our guest, our guest speaker this week Petra Butler who's going to talk about what's been happening in Germany which has had a much more active it sounds like um, legal um, interaction with their COVID rules than we've had in New Zealand so Petra. Thank you Jeff. So I thought what I wanted to talk about is a decision of the Supreme Administrative Court of Lower Saxony, which is one of the 16 Länder which made up the Federal Republic of Germany. And I think that's a very interesting decision for various reasons. The court suspended this Monday the clause of the Lower Saxony Regulation. It's a little bit of a mouthful. There's a regulation regarding infectious disease protection measures to prevent the spread of the coronavirus. And that clause imposed a blanket quarantine for everyone entering Lower Saxony from a foreign country. The court, so the court struck that blanket quarantine down. I want to give you a little bit of a background uh, in, regarding German constitutional law before I tell you about the reasons for the decisions. So the first thing to note is that Germany is a federal state and when it comes to infectious diseases, the federal state actually has a legislative mandate. However, the lender, so the federal the states, can legislate in everything this federal statute doesn't cover. So there is a Bavarian, for example, there is a Bavarian Infectious Diseases Act. On top of it, and to make it a little bit more messy, because it's a federation, there are certain issues the lender only can legislate. And that is, for example, civil defense and the police. So that makes it a little bit of a messy kind of, if it comes to infectious disease control, a little bit of a messy legislative landscape. And because the lender has the legislative power for defense, civil defense and police, the Infectious Disease Protection Act, the federal one, is really only a very high level framework how to deal with infectious disease control. So it leaves the implementation to the lender. And the way that is done is, and that might ring some bells, it might make one of my Dean and Eddie really happy, it is done via an enabling provision in the Inf Infectious Diseases control, control Act that gives the mandate to the lender to enact a regulation to implement the particular subject matter. Now, so what was wrong then with the Lower Saxony regulation? So the court emphasized that the empowering regime in the Federal Infectious Disease Protection Act only allows for specific individual measures to quarantine, and this is a translation, the sick the persons who are under the suspicion to, of being sick, people who are infectious without being sick, and people who might be infectious. The court found that given the worldwide number of cases that have, um, that have to be seen relative to the world population, and even taking into account the high number of unreported cases, would means that not every traveler can be blanketly classified as someone who is supposedly sick or suspicious 
of spreading the coronavirus. And for that reason, a blanket quarantine was unlawful because disproportionate. They kind of look at the question whether or not the lower Saxony government could add this particular group of people, traveler, travelers from foreign countries, add them to the group of the groups um, in the Infectious Diseases, Federal Infectious Diseases Act. And there the court was very clear to include further groups to the one enumerated in the Federal Diseases Act, you would need, need legislative action. So you need an amendment to the Federal Infectious Diseases Control Act to add, for example, everybody coming from a, traveling from a foreign country. It would not be the executive being able to do that on their own because that those measures are such a huge limit on our basic rights, as on human rights, especially so freedom of movement. So it seems to me the German legislation has really the same problems as the New Zealand legislation. There are different yes. words. Exactly. But it's exactly. Badly, That's why I think it's an interesting case. Yeah. It badly fits what the reality of the disease is. Like the problem we've had with the New Zealand statute, and we'll talk about the Borodale case a bit mm -hmm. later, is, is exactly that, isn't it? That the solution, the policy solution, is to basically lock everybody down because we don't or can't be sure of who actually has this disease or it manifests late. And so we can't pick who we need to quarantine in the way we could pick and choose other, other diseases. And that's, yes. what, that's a basic fault with the way we've thought about our legislation in New Zealand. Yeah. But the interesting thing in the German context, of course, is the, the courts seem to be saying that thinking about it in another way might be unconstitutional. That well, this blanket lockdown would never, would never be constitutional. Well, the court actually went a step further and gave an olive branch to the government by basically saying what they could do is what would be basically probably in line with with the egg, with the empowering provision in the in the in human rights under the constitution, would be to if you base it on a rational decision making and scientific ev evidence to devise certain risk regions of risk, and from those re regions of risk, and I'm just making it up now, it's like New York, you could then quarantine everybody, or alternatively, another option would be to say. Everybody entering from a foreign country traveler entering Lower Saxony has to report immediately to the, their local public health authority, which in turn then could test, could interview and make individual decisions to quarantine somebody for 14 days. So I think the takeaway here is one of proportionality. Yeah, blanket is not okay. It has to be individual because of the huge limit on human rights. Yep. Um, yeah, and the courts in Germany have looked at at those at these measures individually quite a bit. Yeah, so they there have been over two thousand decisions, not all on government action, but there have been over forty one constitutional court decisions, and as far as I can tell, every single regulation has been challenged in court. And to give you another example, I think this is just, this is, decision is interesting because they looked at, you know, the world infection, you know, relativities. We had a decision on the 10th of April where the Constitutional Court held church services were not okay. We had a decision by the Constitutional Court on the 29th of April, so 19 days, 19 days later, where they said, well, now, given the situation now, yes, you can't have a full church service, but a, a blanket ban, again, would be disproportionate. So there's a constant challenge in the court of all, all measures. Yeah, and I think that one of the interesting imperatives I've always had is, is it better to have these court challenges going on, or is it better to have what we had yesterday in New Zealand when you had ministers being directly challenged to get their law right? And I think that one of the things we'll talk about a bit later is just in the end how responsive the New Zealand ministers were to people who are voicing objections rather than going to, obviously there's a cultural difference here, 
but I think that's an interesting thing we might talk about a bit later. But just before we get to those interesting developments, Ness has got some developments from Ireland too on the other side of Europe. Um, thanks, Jeff. Um, so in Ireland, we have an example of just picking up on what you were talking about. A piece of legislation was enacted um, back in March because of Ireland's constitutional arrangements. And this is a challenge against the constitutionality of those arrangements. Um, so two quite infamous public figures, O'Doherty and Waters, who could be described as frequent flyers in litigation. Um, so they sought leave um, to seek a judicial review on a number of grounds. So I thought there were many parallels with the A and B um, against Adern decisions that uh, Dean talked to us about um, in one of our previous sessions. So um, for instance, they brought the action against the Minister of Health, the Attorney General, um, Dáil Éireann, which is the Irish Lower House of Parliament, Shannad Éireann, which is the Upper House of Parliament, and for good measure, the Ceann Corla, who's essentially Trevor Mallard, the Speaker. Um, so, uh, they, so leaving aside some of the more technical arguments about court process and standing, so they made a number of um, contentions that the legislation and regulations, which would be very similar to the Public Health um, Act that we have since yesterday, were unconstitutional. So most of these were dismissed by the judge. Um, so they had claimed that the regime was destructive of family life, um, but couldn't really base an argument in that. And um, they had made the point that um, peaceful assembly and practice of religion was affected. Um, but again, the judge said these weren't absolute rights um, and they hadn't shown any evidence um, that the reaction was disproportionate. Um, so the judge really, I think, a bit like the case in A and B and Ardern was quite scathing on, um, they had unsubstantiated grounds, um, they gave long speeches, they had no qualification or expertise, um, they sought to draw parallels with Nazi Germany, which was described as being offensive and observed. Um, so they also, uh, an argument was dismissed that the Minister of Health was acting unconstitutionally by um, making a lot of these rules by regulation rather than legislation, but it was noted that the Constitution did allow for delegated legislation. But I think what an interesting point is that um, Ireland, as you might know, had a general election in February, so um, the government was, was voted out essentially. So what's been in place since February is a caretaker government. Um, under the, the Taoiseach, the Prime Minister, Leo Bradker. Um, so they challenged the constitutionality of the, legis the March legislation on the basis that it had been put into place by a caretaker, Doyle, a caretaker parliament. And also that the, because of the social distancing in the Doyle, the parliamentary chamber, and the lesser numbers that it hadn't been properly um, passed. But again, this was dismissed saying that parliamentary procedure was not something that could be examined due to the separation of powers and it was noted that the constitution did still allow um, the government obviously to continue um, between the election and the formation of a new government. Um, so in summary I think it's really echoes and parallels of the A and B and Ardern decisions that there were some fascinating issues that I think would have much more tightly drafted and case and submissions um, could, could be really really interesting so particularly some of the constitutional rights um, assembly um, and viability of dwellings, which we're going to talk about in a while. Um, so the, but the quality of the applicants' materials was not strong. Um, some of it was what we might describe as, as ranty. Um, so perhaps there might be an Irish Borrowdale along um, with a more tightly drafted um, application, and we might see some of these issues being litigated, but probably a missed opportunity for, for constitutional nerds. <laughs> yeah, so I just wonder why people haven't come. Like in previous seminars, you've talked about how there's a bit of a rebel streak amongst the Irish. Surely there must be some probably better represented rebels who have not sought, who, who could seek no. to take this legal action. Is there a sense of, like obviously Jim, Peter's been in a culture and journey where people are very happy, almost expected to take this sort of litigation but Ireland, like New Zealand, where maybe people are a bit reluctant to actually get courts to decide these issues? Yeah, I mean, I, there may be some other ones in the works that I don't know about, but um, I've actually just been asked to write a piece for the European, a, a European kind of um, blog, series of blog posts on leadership and compliance and that. So I had been drawing some parallels between Leo Bradker, the Irish Taoiseach, who is a doctor, um, and I think they've got a counterpart of Dr. Ashley Bloomfield, Tony Houlihan, who 
again, has been doing these fantastic briefings. Um, people have a lot of trust in the government. Um, they feel as if some progress has been made. So um, again, um, that bit of government through nudge or government through press conference is happening there as well. And I think definitely people are saying that because the Taoiseach is a qualified doctor that um, there's quite a lot of trust in the advice. So um, perhaps people feel as if they've got trust in, in what's going on. But maybe there are some other judicial reviews in the works that we will see coming through. And in fact, he actually went, um, went back on the wards, I think, to help out. So Petra, I think the question I just have is, I always thought Germans are the ones with great trust in government, to be honest, rather than New Zealanders or Irish people. But do you have a sense of why Germans are doing this amount of legal challenging? Well, um, I think I think because in Germany we have this inherent kind of, um, you know, we have rights and we want to see our rights kind of vindicated and if need to be, you know, even the person on the street would say we're going to the constitutional court. But one thing I think which comes to, to to for here as well as the access of justice kind of idea that court challenges are not that expensive. And we have, like, as I always describe Germany, even the garden gnome has legal cost insurance. And so for us going to court is something which does, you don't put, you don't have to mortgage your house to take a challenge. And that might also be one of the reasons because why we see why we see more challenges. Um, I think overall now in Germany, people are protesting a little bit more against the uh, government and the measures. Well, and I, I think it's part of democracy. Yeah. Interestingly, in New Zealand, the people who might have had the resources or desired to sue the government the businesses probably have the least likely to succeed case that I think the general consensus is that the M orders which relate to businesses are probably most likely to survive legal challenge. Whereas it's the, in New Zealand, it's been the um, suits we've had in relation to personal freedom where obviously it really is on your own bat. And Mr. Baradale is self-represented. I think these two people with the, the plaintiffs in the Adurn case were self-represented too. So basically, people have basically lumped the little infringement of their freedom. Although I think some of that's come up recently, again, in a more political sense. Maybe when New Zealanders are more interested in arguing about their rights than maybe in courts, I'm not sure. But just getting back now to what we did last week when we had Claudia, because um, Dean and I, we've just had a talk about a bit of Irish ranting. We're going to talk about a bit of Dean and my ranting about um, the basis for the, the Burradale case or the challenge to the um, orders under stage three. And I wonder if Dean, if you want us to, to just let, pe let people out there know what it was that we replied to and then what our reply was. Yeah, well, the, um, we've got an extended note on it that was published earlier this week on the UK Constitutional Law blog. And, and that follows on from um, Professors Claudia Geiringer and uh, Andrew Geddes, uh, and we heard from Claudia, as Jeff said last week, about the meaning of the section in the Health Act uh, and whether it, uh, that, that's, that's F, if we want to think of it, the, the F provision, and whether the power to broadly quarantine or isolate persons allowed orders of the kind that were issued, requiring everybody in the country to isolate, like, isolate to their homes, um, subject to some exceptions, regardless of whether they are infected with with the virus or not, and and um, uh, uh, you heard from Claudia last week explaining why she thought you, you, that the orders were ultra vires, um, went further than allowed by by that section. Um, we joined that discussion and following them, and we accept the arguments are pretty um, finely balanced. But in that piece, it's no surprise that we said if you put ten legal scholars in in one room. Um, and uh, ask them to debate the question, you'd probably end up with uh, 10 different legal takes on that uh, on the scope of that provision. And I think uh, we're actually allowed to do that in person under level two, uh, but we'll see. But but just very briefly sketching what our argument um, was, uh, we, we, and, and all of these are just indications um, uh, which, 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 which feed off each other. So we, we, we looked at the text, which refers to persons. Um, we think that's broad enough. 
or, or, or can sustain orders of the kind. There's also nothing on the face of the legislation that suggests that the, uh, the power can't be used in a prophylactic way. There's no requirement, that, that the explicit requirement that someone have the infection of the disease. For example, if you look at some of the other objects and verbs there, it's completely plausible that it might be used to disinfect all dogs, regardless of whether the, the, the disease is, 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 is in the dog. The scheme, when you look at the scheme, there's hints either way. Claudia talked last week about the comparison with the, F, the M power, the one that allowed the uh, power to close premises, but had a public notice provision. We agree that weighs pretty heavily, but we also point to part um, 3A, which talks about as a very structured and sophisticated regime for the isolation of a person who's, who is infected. And, and, and you, can, you can draw the comparison back there as well. I guess one of the other things we look, we look back and, you know, what's the purpose, what's the history, tracing it back. Gosh, what do you know? That wording first appeared on the Statute Book of New Zealand in the Bubonic Plague Prevention Act 1900 and soon after was replicated in the Public Health Act there. Um, and, um, and that's where we first see that wording. But you get the sense of a very much an emergency special power uh, uh, that's intended to deal with very nimbly with with very grave risks. And there's no reasons uh, we think that those emergency concerns aren't still relevant in 2020. I guess that's kind of, you know, traditional stat statutory interpretation. What about the other overarching principles? Rights are important. We agree, but of rights and the principle of legality uh, give rights some sort of normative pull um, and, and favour a narrow interpretation, but we don't think though either of those that statute, the Bill of Rights, or the, the, the principle, the principle of legality, it's not a bulldozer. Inevitably, that needs to carry forward some degree of limitation or nuance in, in the game as well. The, the other two points that, that, that Claudia and, and, and Andrew raised is the what I call the institutional locus that you know, who the powers are vested in here, a civil servant, the senior health officer. But we start, we discuss a little bit in that piece, that sort of delicate tango that's been going on between Cabinet and the Director General to try and make that provision work. And I guess probably the, 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 the kicker for me is we know this power's got to be limited and constrained and justified and, and, and so forth. But in general terms, we think that justifiability, that question of whether it's justified, is probably better assessed in application in context in the exercise of the power rather than through narrowing the jurisdictional gateway in the way that we read a particular, the, uh, interpret the meaning of isolate or, or quarantine. So that's a quick sketch. Um, you know, stepping back from it, we agree it's a bit of a stretch of Section 70, but we don't think go, it goes as far as breaking it. Yeah, and I suppose for us, one of the things that was interesting about the public debate that ensued, I think, last week, not because of what Claudia or Andrew Geddes wrote so much. But I think that last week there was a general desire among New Zealanders to start questioning more about the basis of the lockdown and why it was going on for so long. There was certainly a political aspect to that. But one of the things that I found as a lawyer was really interesting was the assumption that you were either legal or illegal, that statutes must give you a definite answer. And I think that's the big point in our piece really is that for whatever reason, the statute is poor in not giving the definite answer. And then the question goes, how do you assess that degree of ambiguity or not? So I just wanted to get Eddie to comment perhaps on, get Eddie to comment on the whole debate around the rule of law. Because I know Eddie was very strong, had some really strong thoughts, not so much about people being worried about the rule of law, but the way in which people started to talk about the rule of law in the last couple of weeks. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. If, if anything, I'm kind of worried that people didn't care about, didn't seem to care about the rule of law, that um, the pretty good substantive job that most people agree the government has done in dealing with this pandemic um, means that we don't need to worry about whether uh, these orders were authorised under the Health Act or whether particular actions taken under those orders for enforcement were authorised. So I thought it was worth spending a bit of time just talking about why that's an important principle, um, why we want government action at all times uh, 
even in emergencies, to be clearly authorized by law. Uh, and there's a, a number of different ways to look at this, but sort of the starting point is that it is a limit on government power, that in our system, you get a law through parliament, it authorizes the executive, the government of the day, to do particular things, and the government can only do what parliament has said that it can do. That links us back to uh, the democratic branch of government in parliament, links it back to us in the electorate, and means that if we don't like the way that the government has exercised the power given to them by parliament, we can boot them out at the next election. So there's a, a democratic linkage to government power when you make sure it's authorized by law. And it also constrains how government can act. They can't just willfully decide they're going to lock up all blue-eyed people, which would be very sad for me, um, or take other draconian actions. More generally, it means that we can plan our lives and how we interact with the government. This is sort of the basis of a theory of um, a American theorist called Lon Fuller in the middle of the 20th century, who made this argument about law has to be able to guide people's actions. That's the point of it. So you have to publish it so people can see it and understand what they can do. It has to only act in the future. So you can change your behavior based on what the law is. You can't do that if it's uh, retroactive. Uh, the way the government applies the law has to line up with the way the law is written. So again, we can plan our lives based on what the law is written down as. And what this means is that there's a degree of safety, a safe space where we can all go about our lives without the government jumping in and interfering because we know the grounds that they can interfere based on the law. If you move away from that, if you let a statement that there is an emergency take away from that obligation, then government can do whatever it wants whenever it declares an emergency. It doesn't need to worry about the law. And we might not be particularly worried about that right now in this current emergency, um, because we think the government's done a reasonably good job and it's a real emergency. But this won't necessarily always be the case. Uh, there are cases in the past where states of emergency have been used as excuses for the government to oppress populations. And if we discard this commitment to the idea that all government uh, authority, all government actions must be authorized, then we run the risk next time an alleged emergency comes along of not being able to object when that power is abused. So I think it's quite important that Mr. Borrowdale is allowed to uh, challenge the legality of the actions the government's taken. Uh, see, we weren't going to get through this this series without someone saying this at least once. You're on mute, Jeff. <laughs> so that just leads us on to what happened in Mr. Baldale's case. And we thought this time, this time last week, we thought there might actually be a whole substantive court of appeal judgment about Mr. Baradale's case. So Mr. Baradale is the Wellington lawyer who has taken a judicial review proceeding, alleging that at least stage three lockdown was illegal, it wasn't authorized. So he, his judicial review is based on Claudia's, or well, the view that Claudia was, was postulating last time. So if he were to win, he would, he would win on the grounds that Claudia has suggested that the words don't quite capture what was actually done as opposed to what Dean it's just you know we didn't don't have that judgment for a very interesting um, reason the plaintiff had applied for an expedited hearing a very unusual procedure whereby he wanted to go straight to the court of appeal and that caused some excitement amongst many of us because we knew that Justice Coach the president of the court of appeal was the author of uh, an article on Fitzgerald and Muldoon, which is the leading case in New Zealand about what the executive can and cannot do when there is a statute, when there is an act of parliament that says the reverse of what the executive wants to do. And what, some of us read that as being indicative of the fact that he might want to hear the, the case, or he might have some interesting things to say about this particular exercise of executive power. What was really interesting about what Justice Coast actually did the next day was he did exactly the orthodox thing, which was to say, 
What Fitzgerald and Muldoon really taught us was, yes, it taught us things about executive power and the need to constrain it, but it also taught us the need to find out facts first. And he pointed out the fact that in Fitzgerald and Muldoon, the case was resolved by what we would now call the High Court. And he said that it was very important that the Crown be able to put facts before the court as to how the orders were actually maybe put into place, but more importantly, I suspect, how the orders were actually enforced. And the result of that is that we've just seen that the case has gone back to the High Court. There is now a timetable for what lawyers call discovery or um, revelation of the underlying facts. That's going to take the best part of a week, it seems, at least. We don't know when this case is going to happen. It might be that what seemed like the most important legal thing in New Zealand last week, the Baradale court action, is at the moment not the most important thing. They actually, we've all moved on somewhat, and we're much more worried about the statute we're going to talk about in a minute. Dean, do you just want to add to that? Say, that yeah, I, I, I think that's really, uh, really, really fascinating because it, it in, in some respects, it, it, it highlights that divide between uh, Claudia and Andrew and their take and, and the take from, from Jeff and me because the, the, the prospect of success, I think, of, of, of the argument put by Claudia and um, Andrew is that it's all a it's just a very pure question of legal interpretation. What are the, what do the words mean? But if you if if you're wanting to invite, if you think it's a fatter case, more facts, more discussion of the the the, the policy justica, justification for and that and so forth, that very much plays into the argument in our theory, the theory advanced by Jeff and me, about how this important power should be exercised. So. Um, Kick down the road, though. Um, I'm not. I'm not sure. I'm prepared to put a put a put a wager on it yet. But but I think the longer it goes on, the the less likely the the, the Borodale success um, is is likely. But the thing, maybe, that really concerned me last week was how people began to talk about what would happen if Mr. Borodale succeeded. Not because that's inappropriate in itself, but that somehow this would indicate something about the motives of the people who had advised the government. And perhaps the thing that I found most disturbing last week was the weaponization, in this case, of what I thought was a very hard edge theory of what the law is. That on any reading, the Health Act is in our view, ambiguous, that any act of legal interpretation comes with it, the peril that you are wrong. And in our system, as Claudia said in her presentation last week, ultimately it's judges who decide whether something is wrong or something is right. And all the lawyers on this panel, I can guarantee you, have thought a particular legal consequence would result in particular facts, and we have been proved utterly wrong by what the courts say. That does not make us people of bad faith. What really concerned me last week was that we were somehow expecting either perfection on the one hand, or we were condemning people to have acted in bad faith. And why that really concerns me and I think people that did that need to take responsibility for this. It's not questioning whether the government was legal or not. That's perfectly acceptable. That's what we do all the time. That's the nature of being in a free and democratic society. If we start impugning people's motives or competency because they have taken a different view of what the law says, we are putting in peril what is very precious about public life in New Zealand, that people make good faith efforts to interpret the law And we accept that those interpretations can be made in good faith, even though they may ultimately be held to be wrong by judges. And sometimes judges use strong words in their judgments. But one of my experiences is in, in my involvement with public service in New Zealand, and that's something we don't think about enough in New Zealand, is how important the expectation that public servants will try and understand what the law is. We think this is a common thing around the world. 
my experience is it's not. It's not necessarily even a common thing amongst countries we often compare ourselves to. We have a very strong tradition of a particular kind of legality. And that's what I thought was being attacked last week. And I'm very concerned we haven't quite put that genie back in the box because it's, we surfaced again in the parliamentary debates yesterday. And it really concerns me because the virus is one thing and the virus needs to be stopped, but also we need to keep what's precious about the way we live together here. And uh, impugning people's good faith as the first call of a political argument is not the way of resolving those issues. That's my rant. Um, what I want to do now very quickly, it's already gone quite a long time, but the big, really big legal development in New Zealand this week has been the COVID-19 Public Health Measures Act, which seems to have been us with forever. And in fact, we only saw it um, at 5.30 on Monday night, some of the people on this presentation. So just very quickly, Eddie, just tell us about the process that, that was surrounding this. Um, because I think some of us are very unhappy still with the process, and I think you're particularly unhappy with the process. <laughs> so if you go back and look at some of the earlier editions of, of this um, series, you'll see that for weeks, I think it might have even been in the very first episode, we were thinking that maybe some legislation about how to regularise these powers would be needed. This is not an issue that popped up as level two was looming and all of a sudden jumped up and surprised the government. Uh, they have known for weeks that this sort of thing would be required. And yet what we get is the day before it is introduced to the house, the evening before it is introduced to the house, an exposure draft is sent to the opposition and a few people selected for their apparent expertise. Um, apparently I'm an expert. Um, <laughs> And apparently I'm not, by the way. <laughs> well, I mean, this seems like a sensible judgment to me, Jeff. <laughs> um, but this was done at... Uh, this was done at incredibly short notice. And then the debate itself took a day and a half in the House, and there was no reference to select committee. So... There were some rough edges, which I think Dean will talk about a bit more to this bill, but they could have been shaved down. They could have been fixed up. And, and what I think is generally, to go to Jeff's comment earlier about the quality of our public service, generally a very good effort from our legislative drafters at the Parliamentary Council office to get something good and sensible in place that doesn't have the same weaknesses as that 1956 Health Act power. But there are still problems with it. And they're the sorts of things that the legislative process is designed to pick up, designed to have public input at select committee, um, so the public can have their say, uh, and designed to come back with amendments from select committee. And the amendments that got out of that 12-hour exposure draft process were minimal. Um, and there are still some things in that, that act that I think probably shouldn't be in there. Uh, and that is down to the process. And they had time to do a little bit more. Not a full month-long select committee process, but, for example, there were two, I think, less urgent pieces of COVID legislation last week that got a three-day trip to a select committee. And I really don't see why this couldn't have at least got that. Yeah, and I think that one of the points that I've made is that there needed to be some time for socialization because the statute on its face looks a lot worse than it actually is. And so one of the most important things, which I think Dean can just elaborate a bit better on, is that bill or the stat the act now is built on a superstructure of understanding of how the law ought to work so when it looks absolute in terms of the orders that might be made in fact those orders can only be made particularly in accordance with new zealand bill of rights act and dean can elaborate that in a second but the importance of that is that a lot of the debates that we've had in the last couple of days have ignored what is probably the most important protection in that act, that orders must respect each of our individual freedoms, except to the degree to which the limitation of them 
is demonstrably justified in a free and democratic society. So it's not true that the Minister of Health can stop a church service. He can only stop a church service if he is satisfied that there is a countervailing justification which is demonstrable in a free and democratic society. So in the very nature of his decision, he has to be guarding those important freedoms. This is something that's often missed by many politicians in Parliament in the last couple of days. But Dean, do you want to comment just a bit more about that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, because you look at the text of the bill, it looks sweeping, it looks draconian, it looks pretty damn ugly at first blush. But as you say, I think it really needs to be understood as, as a modern framework and system. And we're going to understand how, though, that discretion, that dis important discretion under Section 11 to issue orders, how that works in the context of the connected parts and the civic ecosystem as a whole. So if we just zone in on that, that, that Section 11 power, so discretion seems to, to empower unlimited orders. Uh, anything um, can be done to require persons to refrain from taking any specified actions that contribute or likely contribute to the risk of outbreak and so forth. And list some of the things that you might expect are requiring people to stay in a place, refrain from associating with specific persons, stay physically distant, also to require them to be isolated or quarantined in any specified place. So a rolling over of that section uh, 70 uh, order that we've talked about. But we've got to read that discretion in context. So uh, number of factors suggest it's not as extreme and draconian as it first uh, uh, looks. So first off, it's located in the minister within a context of cabinet decision-making and accountability. Check. There's an obligation to have regard to um, advice from the Director General on risks and policies. Check. Now, we might have said that the, um, rather than just having regard to the advice of the Director General, maybe the, the, the Minister should have, uh, Minister of Health should have a particular regard to the, to, to, to the advice. But we can debate that. Obligation to consult with the Prime Minister and Minister of Justice. Check. So there's a consultation obligation. Again, we might have said in the last time of the day, should it have also um, required consultation, say, with the Minister of um, Māori Affairs, say, or um, other, other specified people or bodies? Uh, it's limited by purpose. Check. So there's a constraint. Those, that discretion can only be used if it is, uh, or the Minister is that satisfied that it's appropriate to uh, achieve that purpose. And you know, we check, you know, if you like, but we might, um, we might quibble, should the purpose have been expressed in a slightly more nuanced way? Should it have not just been whether it's appropriate to re, re, um, uh, achieve that purpose, but necessary, but a debate point. But there's a number of other things too. Parliamentary confirmation. If orders aren't confirmed within 60 days, and there's a few, uh, a, a few um, different obligations or date obligations around that, if it's not confirmed, they lapse. The orders are also disallowable through the regulations review process because they're subordinate. So we've got a select committee which is scrutinising them and can trigger their disallowance and so forth. And as Jeff said, probably the biggest uh, significant uh, constraint is the fact they can't be made inconsistent with the Bill of Rights. The Bill of Rights is specifically projected in Section 13, but we also know under the principle in Drew, um, for the law students out there, that uh, secondary legislation that's empowered by empowering provision uh, need to be consistent with uh, the, the, the rights and freedoms subject to reasonable limits because if they're not, they don't get the protection of Section 4 because Section 6 has, has normative pull to ensure that the empowering provision is read consistently with rights and freedom. And then one last thing is that the whole regime has temporal limits. And we've talked about the importance of emergency powers having temporal limits. So in some, um, the, the ability to issue orders or the regime itself are limited in various ways only when there's an epidemic notice, only when there's a state of emergency, or um, Parliament can, uh, or, or the whole regime will lapse if Parliament doesn't renew it every 90 days. So I think stepping back from it's, it's that sort of systems approach and that framework approach is far superior to the old fashioned and blunt section 17. And it's very much what we were calling for in terms of it, but it requires a sophisticated and nuanced read, I think, to understand how those connected parts all interact. Yeah, and I think that's one of the things that was really missing was just this time for people to understand how it's all supposed to work. And I think submitters themselves struggled with that. I know we did, those of us who read the bill in advance, struggled with how to read this and how to make sense of it. And it can only be made sense, really, 
in the context of other statutes. But one of the paradoxes of actually making the powers clear is that it made the powers clear. And that's exactly one of the debates that was going on in Parliament, where suddenly we were confirming that indeed people could actually do, or the government could do exactly what the government had actually done to us. And this, for me, listening to the parliamentary debates was a kind of paradox, because on the one hand, we'd all been calling for a statute that actually made it a little bit clearer that Parliament could do, that government could do this. And when government does that, it then exposes itself quite rightly, I suspect, to attack, because we don't like these powers. And Nessa can talk about, is going to talk about the powers of search in a minute, but just there's resonance of this made for me in lots of projects around Wellington. The famous example of this is the Search and Surveillance Act, which from my perspective is an incredibly liberal piece of legislation, which was designed to further and better control the police and other people that can search our property. But when people found out what in fact the police could do at the moment before that statute, they were outraged. And when we put it into the statute and protected it, we protected our rights and liberties better in the statute, they were outraged because they realized that actually people could come and search their properties if they had reasonable cause. And there's a paradox here. And again, listening to the debate, not to focus on any particular politicians or any commentators at all, but there's an irony here that when parliament does exactly what we all said it should do, give us the damn powers so we know what they are, and they give them and show them what they are, we quite night rightly in a very common law perspective recoil in horror, which is what happened, I think, yesterday without this time of socialization. But Nessa, do you want to, just want to talk about the controversies over uh, the enforcement provisions of the Act? Sure. And um, so, you know, I think we quipped a couple of weeks back about people's sudden interest in the police data. And um, so uh, yesterday and the last few days, as you described, um, Jeff, there's been significant concern about civil liberties and police power, um, which I'm very supportive of there being public and, and political concern about these issues, because it's not something we see uh, very regularly. So I think the point on the warrantless um, search power, which obviously has been quite uh, controversial, the power to enter into someone's um, premises without warrant um, and uh, direct that people uh, comply with these new regulations. And so it's worth noting, obviously, that since the uh, 23rd of March, which I believe was the date we went into level four lockdown and had the first Health Act order, and um, we've had that section 71A of the Health Act power which empowers the constable to assist the medical officer of health. Um, and that includes a power, included a power to enter into or onto any land or building or ship, um, including the use of reasonable force. So when people have been talking about it being unprecedented, um, as you say, Jeff, it is something that has been in force for quite a while. Um, but what I was saying, I think, to a number of people in social media debates last night and, and this morning was, you know, if you're worried about warrantless powers um, since 2009, and um, one of my favorite warrantless powers is, is the DNA legislation, which allows um, a constable to use reasonable force to take a bodily sample if you're arrested for an imprisonable offense, which is practically every offense, criminal offense on the statute book. And again, as you described, Jeff, there are already warrantless powers in the Search and Surveillance Act. So um, there has been discussion, I think, of these powers being unprecedented or sweeping. Um, I would probably push back on that and say it's probably that um, people have, our light has been shed on powers which are there already. Um, so I was trying to go through my own thinking today on, um, you know, whether this power concerns me, myself. Um, and I suppose what I was thinking about was the counterfactual. Um, we need some sort of enforcement power. And I was trying to work through some situations in my own mind where I would think that the use of this power is justified. Um, I think we would very much hope that the warrantless um, entry power would not be used at all, that we can, if there are large gatherings or other concerning behavior that it can be dealt with through um, advice or encouragement, um, but that we will never have to use this power because it is a stringent one. But I mean, say you have a situation where there is an address where we know that somebody is an active case of COVID-19. It looks as if they're having a large gathering. It's probably not practical in that case for there had to have been a requirement that a search warrant be sought um, from a judge. I, I don't think that is practical. So I think it did need to be in there. But again, I think we're really going to need to be watching how this power is used. Um, 
And I know that many of our, our justice advocates, including some of our, our brilliant uh, law graduates, have raised concern on how this may be used, um, particularly against Māori and other over-policed communities. So um, we will very much hope that this will not need to be used, but I can't see any situation where we have, could have had this act without such a power. But I think what was interesting was the discussion presumed that this was something that was being that was un, unprecedented, as you said. I think the other part of the discussion, which was most illuminating for me, is that one of the things we haven't talked enough about in this presentation, in this series, is the place of Maori and in the whole COVID legal response. Um, you could observe that there's been a startling absence, not just from this podcast, but by general policy debate about the position of Maori. And what was yesterday was this really flared up in terms of what was supposed to be, I think, a benign provision by the people that drafted it, that what Nessa has described is true, there is, can be warrant searches of private property, but the government was worried about that because they knew New Zealanders wouldn't like that. And so they set up another accountability mechanism within the statute that required constables to report when they had done that so that it could go for review. And that was to apply to private dwellings as opposed to other premises. And it was to apply to Marae. Now, this is a common drafting convention in New Zealand that we extend the same protections to private property to Marae. It's a way of saying Marae are just as important, if not more important, than Pakeha's private houses, if you like, or anybody's private houses. But that wasn't the way it was taken by the Maori community, who I think feel that they have been excluded from this whole legal making process. And it flared up in a quite dramatic way where the, there was a wholesale rejection of this particular benign provision. And this had a great irony because the government could only respond by removing Marae from the benign provision, the advantageous provision for private premises, private property, and put it back into the general premises provision, which means that there is less protection, somewhat ironically, but I think for me, we're trying to reflect on this is it's really important when we're thinking about the use of public power to not just think of ourselves. I always think of myself, like, is my son's D&D &D party going to get raided on Saturday afternoon? But it's really important to think about people who have actually been subject to public power. And that's one of the things that I hope has been a consistent theme in this podcast is actually trying to say, when you give these sweeping powers, and Nessa and Yvette have made this point, when you give these powers, who are they going to be used against? And that's why I think we're still looking for the ethnicity data, aren't we, aren't we Nessa? Um, yeah, and I, I think that was the point I was making, actually speaking to a journalist yesterday, that um, you know, when these powers are being used, um, you know, they need to be used in the, the, the gathering in Kandal or maybe city in Karori as much as they're used um, you know, in a, a state house suburb. And I think that is the issue that um, many Māori were identifying yesterday. Um, but I think, um, you know, you've described that really well, Jeff, but it has, um, that debate yesterday has meant that Marae um, actually have much less protection and they're in there with the general premises rather than the private um, uh, dwelling house. So um, that's been somewhat unfortunate, but I think it does demonstrate the discussion we were having earlier around um, I can understand how from Māori um, seeing Marae actually being enunciated specifically in the bill may have been very alarming and concerning. Um, and it goes to the idea that there wasn't that time to actually consider um, the, the, the bill properly um, and to, to have the considered debate around these issues. That is, but we just need to spend just a couple of more minutes, sorry, if people are still with us, because we've done exactly what should have happened, did happen yesterday, but what shouldn't have happened yesterday is going to happen again today in our podcast, is that Parliament spent an enormous amount of time talking about the enabling statute. But what's really important about this enabling statute is how it's actually going to get used, because the whole purpose of the statute is actually to set up a structure, which are now the, rule, the, level, th the level two um, rules. And just very, very quickly, Dean, because these came out very late last night. We, we have a definite, they weren't out at 11 o'clock last night, and they weren't they were up at five o'clock this morning, so someone worked very hard last night. Dean's worked hard since, just trying to make a little bit of sense of the legal structure behind the restrictions. Um, I just mourn myself that bubbles 
are no longer part of the New Zealand le legal landscape. I think this was a wonderful drafting and innovation of the New Zealand statute book, but no, they're no longer theirs. We've replaced it, Dean, with intermingling, is my understanding. That's right, intermingling, but with physical distancing to the greatest extent possible, is the new bubble. Um, but, but stepping back from the rules, I think it's pretty savvy drafting for uh, some quite sophisticated regulation going on under level two. Pretty low level, pretty benign, um, and there's different rules for, for different tiers, a tiered approach to different gatherings, high risk ones, uh, gatherings of, of friends and whanau, and, and lower risk, risk ones. There's some business rules as well, and they're uh, obviously trying to um, embed this physical distancing. They take a bit longer to unpick, but having gone to the barber at 9.45 this morning, I can report the barber seemed to be doing all the right things with the PPE, the QR codes, uh, taking my details and uh, physical distancing, and I wasn't allowed to hang up my coat either. Um, so, 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 uh, first, first reaction, pretty good, um, a, a pretty good set of rules. I suspect it's going to be a rolling mall, as always. That these ro rules will evolve, evolve as they get a better sense of level two and deal with some of those problematic issues. I still don't know whether, as a as a grassroots rugby player, maybe coming out of retirement for an old, old cameo. Um, uh, whether uh, uh, community rugby, how that works at the moment, I think it's we're 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 um, we're a lower risk gathering if we stay for less than ten, so that's all we can do. But I suspect that might change. But but I, I guess my other observation on the rules very quickly is I think it's a case of the drafters taking the rule of law very seriously. I think there's a very genuine and uh, deep attempt to try and make the rules accessible and understandable. There's a very useful outline of how it all works. There's an um, example of a day in the life of Jess, I think it's Jess, and her, uh, how all the rules apply. And there's some really interesting things about the language. And if we had more time, we might be able to reflect on uh, why the draft is seized on the language of friends and whanau as the operative words for the um, familial gatherings or the, uh, the uh, 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 in our homes and so forth. It's one of the things that really has interested me about the drafting evolution has been the first orders that came out on the day of the lockdown were very much public health documents. They were things clearly produced by people who upmost thought was how you describe a public health problem and public health solutions. At some point they'd become legalized and certainly the, the level three rules were very legal in the way they were drafted. And this more recent iteration seems to be a bit of a swing back towards the public health way of drafting in the sense of being less perhaps I think legally precise, but more trying to explain to people what they really should do in order to keep everybody safe. And it's a really interesting kind of drafting um, adventure that the New Zealand legal system has been on from public health to law and now to uh, quite an amalgam of the two. Um, just before we go, I just wanted to um, just ask for a couple of any last comments from anybody, maybe what they're looking for next time, Eddie. What do you think about for next week? Uh, so in the absence of a, a proper process before this uh, level two bill now act was passed uh something that uh i've suggested and and um some of our other colleagues have suggested i've also seen this from uh the human rights commission and amnesty international is that we send the act to select committee for some post enactment review with the government signaling that it is open to revisions if that is necessary uh, i'm not sure how hopeful i am that that will uh, that that will happen but it would be great to see that and Petra, what are you looking for next week? I'm not quite sure if I'm looking for next week. I think generally speaking, I would look forward to robust discussions. I do think that these are so unprecedented times where everybody does the best they can, but it also means that we need an overall robust discussion by academics. I would love to see more court cases. Uh, to test what the government is doing, and I would wish a government that is open, reaching out to discussion and open for criticism. And Nessa, final word for Nessa. Um, so uh, something we had uh, uh, foreshadowed last week was there's new court protocols which are actually like educational institutions starting on Monday um, to give some certainty. So 
Um, although the machinery of justice is slowly uh, creaking back to operation, um, we're going to expect remote participation and AVL use for quite a while, and obviously scheduling is going to be a major issue. So um, Yvette and I spoke about that last week, um, a plug for our piece in the spin-off about jury trials, and we've got another one in preparation about some of the human rights issues coming out of remote participation. So I uh, hope to discuss that a bit more next week. So all in all, I think there's plenty for us to come back to next week. Um, but once again, I end, as I ended all of these, to thank those people who are still with us. Um, hopefully some of you have found these issues as interesting as, as we have. We could probably talk for another three or four hours, and we might in the future still talk for three or four hours. Or Petra might want us to talk for even longer than three or four hours about some of these issues. But we thank you for being with us, and we'll almost certainly be back next week with the next part of our ongoing discussion on the lockdown. Cheers. See you then.